everyone. Um, the next session is by Alex Holst, Senior Policy Manager at the Good Food Institute Europe. He focuses his career on influencing public policies that do the most good for animals and create a more sustainable food system. Uh, previously, Alex worked on climate change and international development and GIZ, uh, the German Development Agency. Uh, we'll have a Q&A after the talk, so if you have any questions, please use the question section in the swap card app in this specific session. Um, you can see there's an option for questions. Just click that and insert, insert it there. Thank you. All right, good afternoon. Um, I hope you're still having some energy after an almost full day of, of EAGX. Um, I'm going to spend about 30 minutes talking about farmed animal welfare and alternative proteins, um, different approaches to effective animal advocacy, um, and also I want to cover at the end a bit what you can do, um, what everyone in uh, this community can community can do to help the cause um, of alleviating animal suffering. I will cover some of the approaches um, that the animal movement has taken um, that have been deemed to be really effective. If after the talk you want to really dive into what those approaches are in practice um, and some of the details, I'd really encourage you to reach out to some of the animal organizations um, that are in this room here today or at the conference. Um, they will be able to um, give you way more um, detail on that. In Swapcard, you can click on the organization tab and actually see all the organizations that are present here. So let's get started. First, let's talk about the scale of the issue. So globally, at the moment, more than 180 billion vertebrate animals are farmed each year. About 75 billion of those are land animals. And just to put that a bit into perspective, 75 billion, that's almost 10 times um, the global human population today. It is also almost the total number of all humans who have ever been born. And if you look at who those animals actually are, what are the species, the overwhelming number of farmed animals are fish and chickens. And that is not even counting wild-caught fish. It's not counting um, invertebrate animals that are farmed, like shrimp. And about 90% of those animals live in conditions that we would call intensive systems or factory farms. They are part of what we call industrial animal agriculture. In those systems, animals are frequently subjected to extreme confinement, overcrowding, painful mutilations, and other conditions that cause intense suffering. So when we think about how can we do the most good for those animals, I think over the last few years, we've really come with, up with some tentative conclusions and lessons as a community. And I just want to highlight some here. One is to really focus on the animal species who suffer the most. And the numbers you just saw on the previous slide, I think, already give an indication. It's just an overwhelming amount of fish and chicken in those factory farms. And when we look at some of the research that has been done by groups like Charity Entrepreneurship into um, what actually the individual experience in terms of welfare is for those different animals, chicken and fish are also amongst the species that actually suffer the most intensely. So really focusing on that, pivoting towards those species has been a trend over the last few years um, in this movement. The other lesson has really been to focus on changing institutions. And by that, I mean influencing both companies and corporations and focusing on influencing governments and public policy. In terms of approaches within effective animal advocacy, the first is really trying to improve the living conditions of the animals that are in the system today and the animals that will be in the system in the future. And there we've had really as a community some amazing successes um, with corporate welfare campaigns and with um, public welfare reforms. And I just want to highlight some of these um, briefly. 
So corporate campaigns um, have really, over the last years, um, been amazing in getting cage-free pledges from companies. So this could be fast food chains, um, food service providers, retailers, um, where NGOs go um, and start a campaign. They talk to the companies, um, and they ask them to um, commit to phase out the use of eggs from caged um, hens. The other area where there's been recent progress is on improving the welfare of broiler chickens. So these are chicken raised for meat, and really improving their welfare by getting companies to sign the so-called better chicken commitment. The Open Wing Alliance, which is a coalition of more than 80 organizations spanning the globe, has really gotten very successful in getting those corporate pledges. They have reached, I think, more than 2,200 cage-free pledges by companies, and more than 400 better chicken commitments signed by other corporations. That's a huge, huge step forward. But still, right now, only about 11% of all egg-laying hens are cage-free. That's about 850 million. But there are more than 7.5 billion hens um, raised for eggs. So there's a long way to go still. And the other area is really public reforms. Um, and there, as so often in policy, um, progress can be a bit slower, um, but not less meaningful. I just want to highlight two examples. In California, Proposition 12 passed a couple of years ago. And that was basically a referendum enacting a law that outlaws the use of individual cages for hens and other animals. And advocates have been really successful first in passing that law and then also in protecting that law against challenges that followed um, the passing of the law. Another example here from Europe is the European Citizens Initiative and the Cage Age. And so this was um, a colossal effort by a range of organizations they collected more than 1.2 million signatures by EU citizens to end the cage age, asking the European Union to phase out and eventually ban the use of individual cages for egg-laying hens, for ducks, for rabbits, for other animals. They reached that milestone a couple of years ago. And last year, the European Commission, the executive arm of the European Union, committed to introduce legislation that would phase out and ban the use of cages by the end of 2027. There's still a way to go in going through that long legislative process, but um, this is a great start. Now, the other approach the community has taken is really to look at, OK, how can we not just improve the living conditions of animals, but reduce the total number of farmed animals? In essence, how can we change what people eat? And even here, um, over the last few years, there has been a shift towards um, changing institutions. Traditionally, and before that, um, there has been a lot of energy and effort put into individual dietary change. So trying to convince people to eat less meat, um, to go vegetarian or vegan, to educate consumers, to raise awareness. But research by several organizations, um, like the Sentience Institute and others, has, have really shown that these kind of individual dietary change advocacy has not been very effective, at least with a large um, share of um, the consumers. And so for the rest of the talk, I'm going to focus really on how we at GFI approach this issue of changing what people eat, but to actually change the way we produce food instead of asking individual consumers to give up the food that they like. But before that, let's step back for a second. So we talked already a bit about animal suffering. Um, but industrial animal agriculture really also causes a lot of other severe challenges that we face today in the world. One of them is climate change. Animal agriculture directly causes more than 20% of global greenhouse gas emissions. It fuels deforestation, biodiversity loss, um, and it causes local environmental pollution of air and water. Conventional meat production is also just a very, very inefficient way of producing food. It takes about nine calories of feed to give to a chicken to get one calorie of chicken meat out of it. And chicken is one of the most efficient, the most efficient land animal, as a matter of fact, that we have. 
And so those nine calories of grains that we give to chicken, we have to use all the water, all the land, all the fertilizers of, um, to grow the, the grain, and then we ship the grain around to give it to chicken. We could actually use that land, we could use that water, we could use all those resources to grow, feed, uh, to grow food for human consumption. And lastly, industrial animal agriculture really comes with some severe public health risks. And here we're not only thinking about nutrition um, and healthy diets, but actually the public health risks associated with the production. More than half of all the antibiotics that humans use today globally, we actually give to farmed animals, not to humans for, for medicine. And that is because lots of those animals, they live under such poor conditions, under so poor, poor health conditions that they just require a lot of antibiotics. Um, but that is actually fueling antimicrobial resistance and is contributing to the development of superbugs that are just not treatable anymore with our conventional antibiotics. And lastly, um, zoonotic diseases are just, the risk of zoonotic diseases is just fueled by um, those intensive animal farming conditions. You cram together a lot of genetically similar animals um, in, a, in a close confinement. Um, in poor health conditions, that's just the perfect breeding ground for viruses to spread around, um, to mu mutate, and eventually jump to humans, because those animals interact with humans, both with farm workers and then with slaughterhouse workers. All of those facts we've actually known for quite a while. Scientists, at least, have been knowing this for quite, quite a few years and um, have actually raised alarm, um, especially on, on the point of climate change. But the reality is this. On this graph, you can see um, both historical global meat production up, up until 2019, in this case, roughly, has been going up and up and up over decades. And it is projected up until 2050 to go up by at least 50%. That's what the UN Food and Agriculture Organization says. And there are some other estimates that actually look at much higher increases up to 100% global meat production. So the question is, okay, given that situation um, and given the fact that so far dietary change advocacy is just not delivering the change at the scale and at the pace that we need, what can we do? And so at GFI and in the wider alternative protein sector, the approach is really to look at what does really drive consumer choice when it comes to food. And we know there from behavioral studies and behavioral science that the foundational drivers of food choices are taste, price, and convenience. That does not mean that other considerations, like health considerations, environmental impact, or animal warfare, do not matter at all. They do at least for a small group of consumers. But in the end, the average consumer, if they don't expect a product to taste good, if it's not affordable, or if they don't know where to buy it, how to cook it, how to use it in a meal, they are just very, very likely, unlikely to buy it, even if they think the product is actually better for the environment or animal welfare. And so that's where our approach starts, because we really believe we can create meat, eggs, dairy, and seafood in a more sustainable and efficient way, but without, um, and without the animal suffering. But we can do that by creating it from plants, directly from animal cells, or through fermentation. That's why we accelerate alternative proteins, and I will talk about those a bit more in a second. But in order for them to be successful, we need to really make them as delicious, as affordable, and as accessible as conventional animal products. Because in that way, we can really have consumers chose those alternatives and not asking them to give up something they really like. So at GFI, we work um, across these three programmatic areas. We work with governments on policies that support alternative proteins, R&D, and um, supportive regulations. We have a team of scientists and that work with universities and researchers and students across the globe to build the scientific ecosystem. And we work with companies, both small startups and big corporations, to get them to invest in alternative proteins and to have a competitive, thriving commercial ecosystem. We do all of that work globally. So we have teams in the US, in Brazil, in Europe, in Israel, in India, and in Asia Pacific. And our whole operation is funded entirely by philanthropy. So by charitable donations from individuals and from foundations. OK, let's talk about what are these alternative or sustainable proteins. 
before I do that, can I just ask for a show of hands, who in this room thinks they already have a pretty good understanding what sustainable proteins, what alternative proteins are? Could you just raise your hand? Okay, great. I think then we have a good mix of people who are a bit more aware and some other curious people who, who came to the talk to learn more. That's great. So plant-based meat, that's the first one. When we talk about plant-based meat, eggs, dairy, and seafood, we really mean the new generation of plant-based products that try to biomimic the taste, the texture, the mouthfeel of an animal product. And so we're not talking about tofu or tempeh or a bowl of lentils. They are also delicious, if you ask me. But we really need to reach the consumers that like meat and they don't want to give it up. And so brands like Beyond Meat, Impossible Foods, or here in Europe, very common, the Garden Gourmet range, they really try to get you a burger and chicken nugget um, or sausage made from plants, but actually tasting very similar to meat. Fermentation um, is the second category. And fermentation is, of course, a yeah, food technology that um, human societies have um, applied for uh, thousands of years um, in brewing beer, in creating yogurt and cheese, and using it as a food preservative. In the alternative protein industry, um, fermentation is really um, an enabling technology that can um, utilize microorganisms such as fungi um, or bacteria or yeast to create specific ingredients, specific proteins or enzymes um, or other molecules that can then be used as an ingredient in a plant-based product, for example, to improve the flavor, improve the taste. The other way to use fermentation is really to select specific microorganisms that are just very efficient at creating protein biomass um, at scale. And then you can use that biomass to produce your meat alternative. A famous example of a, um, of a fermentation um, ingredient is Impossible Foods heme. So this is the key ingredient that gives the otherwise plant-based Impossible Burger its really meat-like texture and almost um, makes it taste as if it is bleeding. That is a fermentation-derived um, protein um, from a yeast. The last category is cultivated meat. Cultivated meat is real animal meat um, made from animal cells but grown outside of an animal. Um, it provides the same taste, the same nutritional profile um, as conventional meat because it really is animal meat at the cellular level. But what you don't need with cultivated meat is to raise animals on factory farms um, to feed them, um, to crowd them, and then at the end to slaughter them. The basic process looks like this. So you start with a small sample of stem cells that you can get, for example, from a biopsy from an animal. Um, you isolate those cells and you put them in a large uh, fermenter or um, cultivator. Um, picture a large metallic tank similar to what you would see in a modern beer brewery. There you put the cells in a nutrient-rich media um, you give them warmth to provide the right environment, and the, so the cells start to proliferate, to grow, to multiply. And eventually, you put them um, in a second environment where they differentiate in the different types of cells that you want to create. So this could be your muscle cells, your fat cells, your connective tissue, all the things that actually make up the meat that we eat. Depending on the structure that you want to um, have in your final product, you might need to provide so-called scaffolds, um, basically telling the cells uh, how they need to grow to create um, fine cuts of meat, for example. And in the end, you can harvest um, the product and put it in the right shape. And really, any type of meat and fish and seafood has been produced in this way, at least at a small scale. So this is something that is possible and that is feasible. The big challenge for this um, sector, of course, right now is scaling up, bringing costs down, and really developing um, yeah, an industry that can produce cheap cultivated meat at scale. OK, but how sustainable are those alternative proteins actually compared to conventional meat? This is just a snapshot of some of the life cycle assessments and some of the environmental studies that have been done. Um, and we see across the board that all alternative proteins um, have the potential to uh, emit far fewer greenhouse gas emissions on like a per kilogram uh, basis, between 90 and 92% fewer greenhouse gas emissions. They use much less land, up to 99% less land much less water, and are just, in general, much less resource um, intensive. The exception is for cultivated meat, you just need more energy because you have to fuel those 
um, those production processes. And so there it's really important that we make sure cultivated meat um, is produced with renewable energy in order to really um, capture all the benefits with regard to climate change. So how, how have these industries been doing? This is a graph that shows global private invested capital into all three alternative proteins. And as you can see, between 2010 and yeah, 2017, 2018, we were really um, at a fairly low level. Um, since 2019, this industry has really grown enormously. So if you can, yeah, if you look at the graph, I think in 2019, we've, for the first time, we reached more than 1 billion US dollars private investment. And last year in 2021, it was 5 billion. So that shows you a bit the trajectory. And it's an enormous success story over the last few years. But at the same time, we also have to say this is happening at a very, very small scale compared to the huge trillion dollar global meat business. And so thinking about plant-based, um, the, the really good plant-based options that have a similar taste to meat have only really been on the market for the last few years. Fermentation is only now really breaking through into the market. And cultivated meat, while well, there has been a first product being introduced in Singapore in late 2022, uh, sorry, in late 2020, um, the costs are still far too high, um, and we are not nowhere near like price parity with conventional meat. So there is a lot still to do. And one, one area where we focus on is to really think about these investments. Um, and the previous slide showed private investment, but what could really supercharge alternative proteins is public investment in research and development. This is a highly neglected area. If you just look at other technologies that we as societies have decided to go all in on and to fund and to advance in order to solve climate change, for example, we can look at renewable energy. Global research and development investment into renewable energy in just a single year in 2011 was 250 billion US dollars. Most of that went into solar and wind, the rest into biomass, biofuels, hydro, and some others. And that seems right, right? We do want to solve climate change. Um, we do need to decarbonize our electricity system, our energy system. So we need to really do anything we can as a global society um, to solve that issue. And innovation and research is one of that, um, that approach that we really need to go all in on. But in comparison, if we think about decarbonizing food production and meat production, up until today, total combined R&D into meat alternatives is about 5 billion US dollars. And that's a fairly generous estimation that our analysts um, did. And this is not five billion in a single year. This is all R&D investment ever. So there seems to be a gap here. And closing that gap is really what we at GFI um, have made one of our main purposes. And so I want to talk about how we do that. How do we try to like, mobilize hundreds of millions and eventually billions of resources into R&D for alternative proteins? So here in Europe, um, I want to talk about a bit about the case in the UK and their R&D policy. The UK left the European Union in early 2021. And at that point, the government was at a place where they said, OK, um, we are more independent now. We should use that independence. Um, so they asked uh, an expert panel um, to review all the UK food policies and come up with a national food strategy. Um, with recommendations on how the UK should, could transform their um, food policy. And so we and our policy team and GFI Europe, we worked with that team that wrote the strategy. And after about months, about half a year of engagement, um, they finally published the strategy in summer 2021 and recommended to invest 125 million pounds in alternative protein research and innovation. Huge success. We were very happy at the beginning. Great. But this was just a recommendation. So um, after, um, after we uh, celebrated for a bit, we said, OK, well, now we have to double down. We have to work with the government. We have to really make sure that this recommendation is translated into government policy. And so our UK colleagues um, have been engaging with civil servants, um, with political leaders in the UK government um, directly in bilateral meetings. We co-hosted the first event in the European, uh, sorry, in the UK Parliament about cultivated meat. Um, this is my colleague Ali Walden. 
who led our efforts here speaking to an audience of about 39 MPs about the need for cultivated meat innovation. Um, and we got, through our engagement, the UK government to commit that they want to be a leader in alternative protein innovation and research in the future. And this is what they put in their official response to the national food strategy. And this is where I would have actually said in this talk, um, this is work in progress. We still need to make sure this money is um, being delivered. But just yesterday, we got word that the UK Research Council, which is the, the basic public institution giving out research money, um, did pledge to deliver 20 million pounds in alternative protein research. Again, we were happy, we celebrated for a bit over WhatsApp because I was already here in Berlin. It was a great moment. But you might already see 20 million, 125 million. There is some room for improvement. So we are optimistic that over the next few months we are going to um, double down and actually get the government to, to commit to um, spend most, if not all, of that money into alternative protein research. Okay, so that's policy engagement, governmental level, but what, what can everyone do? What can you do if you want to contribute to farmed animal welfare, if you want to contribute to the alternative protein sectors? I want to highlight just a few options. First, you can donate to effective animal charities. You can, of course, donate to GFI, which I would always ask you and encourage you to do, but there are many other groups in this space that are very um, successful and very effective. Um, there's some great facilitation of how you can um, do your giving through organizations like Giving What We Can or Effective Spenden here in Germany. And organizations like Founders Pledge or Animal Charity Evaluators um, really have great research on um, what are the best interventions, what are the most effective charities in this space. So I encourage you to check those out. Second, if you are really interested in maybe exploring a career in animal advocacy, alternative proteins, I really urge you to check out Animal Advocacy Careers. It's a great organization. They provide skills profiles, resources, educational resources, um, and generally do surveys on talent gaps and um, where really the needs in the movement are. And they also have a great um, page on skilled volunteering and how, you, how to get into volunteering in case you're early in your career and you really want to try things out. And lastly, I would encourage you, if you want to work maybe broadly in alternative proteins, not just in nonprofits, but for the sector, for startups, to sign up for our alternative proteins talent database. If you put your details there, um, you can put your name, your contact details, and what you want to work in, maybe what your expertise is, and you give permission to companies in the space and to other nonprofits, not just UFI, to contact you directly. Um, in case they have open roles, um, they might contact you and ask you if you would be interested in applying. What about if you are maybe an early um, stage student at a university? Um, is there something you can contribute? The answer is yes. At GFI, we really identified universities as a catalyst for this entire field. Um, that is partially because we really need the research to happen um, itself at universities, but also because we need to build a talent pipeline for the alternative protein industries. And so we have an own dedicated program, the Alt Protein Project, to find, to train, and to empower student leaders at key universities to really help this academic ecosystem for all protein. They raise awareness, they build, build a community at the universities, um, they help with education, building courses for alternative proteins, um, and actually they spark research because they talk to their professors um, and their teachers, um, and eventually that, that leads to innovation because the technological breakthroughs at those universities can then be commercialized and spun out um, into startups. And so if you're a student, um, there is opportunity here. Um, our L protein project has been growing um, tremendously, and now we have about 36 chapters at more than, well, at 36 universities spanning five continents in 17 countries, including in the UK, in Germany, in the Netherlands, Belgium, Denmark, Norway, Serbia, and Israel. So these are all our universities. Um, if you find yourself, um, if you find your university on this map, congratulations, there is already an all-protein chapter that you can contact, and I warmly encourage you to do so. If your university is not on here, don't despair. Um, we plan to really expand that project even further next year. And so if you're really keen to um, get into all-protein and you are passionate about it, I would really encourage you to think about 
maybe founding your own L-Protein chapter next year. Um, please do get in touch if that's something you're interested in, or I can connect you to our academic engagement team. We really want to broaden this entire field, and we need everyone to chip in, um, because then together we can really make a difference in um, advancing alternative proteins for the benefit of people, of animals, and the planet. There's much more to say and much more to learn about effective animal advocacy. Um, I put some links up here. There's great resources online by organizations like Sentience Institute or Rethink Priorities. You can also join the Effective Animal Advocacy Facebook group, which I would encourage you to do. And if you really want to dive into more into alternative proteins, all the technical and scientific details, um, our webpage has enormous resources, including an online course on the science of alternative proteins, the state of the industry reports, a student guide, um, and more resources that you can read. Thank you for your attention. So, yes, if you have any questions, please insert them in the swap card session. Um, there's a, you can click questions and just insert your uh, questions there. Great. Um, why don't we start off with a question. Following up on the previous question, uh, what's your projection for the forward price of media for cultivation? I'm not sure what the previous question was. I guess it was posted afterwards. <laughs> but the question is the, the price for culture medium, for cultivated meat, is that right? Uh, price for, price of, uh, I think they're, Great. Okay. Uh, that's a great question. Um, and I'm not sure I will be able to answer that question fully because I'm not working on the technological side. Um, but so we um, at GFI, we commissioned um, a techno-economical analysis by uh, CE Delft, um, a scientific consultancy firm a few years ago, to actually figure out, okay, what are the cost bottlenecks um, that exist and that the industry still needs to solve in order to reduce um, cost and actually get to price parity. And media cost, so this is the cell culture media that the cells really need in order to get all the nutrients and to grow. Um, media culture is the, the most important cost driver. So making sure that, um, for example, growth factors in that media can be produced at low cost, that's an absolute priority for the industry. Um, and they did um, find pathways where um, improvements there can be made over the next 10 years or so in order to get to a price for a minced cultivated meat product that is in the range of price parity of um, conventional beef. Um, we don't think this is um, inevitable. We definitely need more innovation. We need more research. There are enormous research challenges in terms of scaling up production and engineering capacity we need. Um, so we really need that kind of investment and buy-in, but it's possible. And so that's what we try to, to get to. Thank you. And there are skeptical voices around the technical feasibility of producing cultivated meat cheaply at scale. What is your perspective on this? Yeah, I think I answered this partially um, in my previous answer. Um, there have definitely been some skepti skeptic voices, and it's really useful to actually have those um, analysis that, um, that are a bit more skeptical out there, because only in that way can we um, advance the science of how the scale-up can be successful. Um, because what those analyses show is like where are the pressure points and where are the bottlenecks that we really need to solve. Um, but again, we are actually very optimistic and our scientists over the years have become more optimistic and more bullish on cultivated meat being feasible um, at price parity. Um, so yeah, we remain optimistic that this is possible. And can you explain more about how at the moment stem cells are being taken from animals? Um, from an anti-species point of view, I'm afraid animals will still be exploited for that and species is neglected as the cause for animal exploitation. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so because this is real animal meat and you, you need um, some animal cells to start the process with, animals are still involved in some way. Um, different companies um, seem to be taking different approaches. So there are companies who, um, for each of their batches of production cycles, want to go back to an animal um, and take a biopsy. I should say though, these biopsies are really extremely small. You need about the um, size of a peppercorn of cells in order to start the process. Um, and so you can do that with anesthetics um, with a fairly painless biopsy. 
other companies take a different approach. So they take those uh, stem cells once, and then they try to immortalize those cells in a cell bank. Um, and then they can always go back to that cell bank um, to, to take some of the cells and then um, feed them into their production process. So the idea, I think, in general is that we just need far fewer animals, um, and those animals can actually um, be kept in conditions that are much more, um, much more suitable for their natural um, ability and their natural instincts um, to live in. Thank you. And what is the share of effort invested by GFI uh, in the different alternatives, plant-based, fermentation, cultivated? I'm sorry, can you repeat so the first part of the question? The question was, what is the share of effort invested by GFI? Yeah, that's a great question. So at GFI, we are completely agnostic into which of those three categories eventually will win out over the other. I actually don't think that we should think about those three categories as entirely distinct. So I mentioned already with regard to fermentation, this is really an enabling technology. You can use a lot of fermentation ingredients for plant-based to make it better. And actually, we will probably see a lot of precision fermentation being used as input for cultivated meat. And conversely, um, we expect to see also a lot of hybrid products, especially in the beginning, um, because cultivated meat is still very expensive. Um, it might make sense from a cost point of view to really um, mix animal cells with plant protein in order to um, get lower prices while still having like really good taste. This is actually what Eat Just, the first cultivated meat startup that actually brought a product to market in Singapore did. So their cultivated chicken nugget is actually a hybrid chicken nugget made out of animal cells and plant protein. I'm sorry, I wasn't, I'm not sure that I asked this one, but what's your take on the correlation between standards of living and meat consumption? That's a really good and a really big question. Um, and I'm not sure I'm, I can answer that uh, off the top. I mean, I would say that I mentioned these two approaches to improving living conditions and like reducing the total number of animals. I don't think we should think of those actually also as distinct. Um, they actually interact. So one hope within the animal movement is that by improving living conditions, um, for example, by providing more space to animals um, in farms, we actually raise the price of meat, um, make it more expensive to be sold. And in that way, we um, hopefully reduce meat consumption. And we also make it more likely that alternative proteins can compete with conventional meat at an earlier stage because those price points um, will be similar earlier. That's at least the hope. Thank you. And uh, you mentioned large corporations pledging to improve animal welfare. What's the track record of large companies actually following up on their pledges and how likely are they to just commute to a pledge for the sake of PR? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, and again, I would ask if someone's in a room from an animal org working on those corporate pledges to maybe add some detail um, after my answer. But it is definitely a concern for the movement to make sure that those pledges are actually followed. And I think especially um, in the case of um, cage-free pledges, um, there is more efforts now being put into, okay, how can we make sure there is enforcement, there's monitoring, there's actually evaluation of how the companies follow through in order to really make sure that the living conditions of those animals are improved. Um, and I think partly uh, similar, uh, there's a question of why do large companies agree to animal welfare reforms? Is there an incentive for them? Yeah, I mean, I think there are different motivations. Uh, one of them is just the tactics that um, NGOs apply. So they usually offer, they make a demand. They say, this is what we need you to do in order to improve welfare. And then if you don't follow that demand, um, we can mobilize our supporters. We can um, put together a PR campaign um, that puts a lot of pressure on you. So there's a lot of, um, yeah, carrot and stick, if you will. Um, we praise you if you, um, commit to this pledge. And if you don't, then um, you might get a lot of negative PR from that. And I think that has been proven quite effective because companies really care about how they are perceived with consumers. They care about bad media coverage, at least some of them. Um, and yeah, that's uh, one of the main incentives. And then there are actually some companies who really like to um, do things that are good for animals, believe it or not, but they feel that they are in such a competitive environment um, that it's hard for them to, to do that because they would be at a disadvantage in terms of price. Um, and I think we see a mix of those 
um, actually working um, for the benefit of animals. And what's your view on how we can, uh, oh, sorry, a new question <laughs> bounces around. Um, and what's your view on how we can uh, increase public acceptance of alternative proteins? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think um, what we've seen is that for plant-based alternatives, there seems to be quite a high acceptance already. And that is in part because those products have now been on the shelves for quite a while. So they are, in a sense, they've been normalized. Um, and when we think about these more novel proteins like cultivated meat, um, we actually see in consumer studies quite a significant number of consumers responding that they would be willing and would be um, yeah, curious to try it. Um, off the top of my hat in Europe, um, it depends from country to country, but we see between 30 and 60% of consumers saying they are willing to give this a try. But we have to, I think, take those numbers with a grain of salt because most consumers have never heard of cultivated meat. Um, they are not familiar with it. They don't have friends or family who have tried it. Um, so I think the more these products will actually be in the public conscience and they will show up in our supermarket shelves and people will first try it, the more they will actually come to just see them as one of the other options that is out there. And is the nutritional profile any different between conventional and grown animal products, meat, milk, fish, and those that are lab grown? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so at the cellular level, those products are the same. So in terms of nutrition, they are also very similar. But there might be instances where the nutritional profile of a cultivated product um, is slightly different um, if you would just grow the cells and then harvest the, the, harvest the cells. And that is because some of the um, conventional uh, meat and especially seafood products, they get some of their nutritional profile from actually the environment that the animal interacts in um, while it um, is being raised and while it lives. The best example for this is maybe fish. So lots of conventional seafood and fish um, is seen as being fairly healthy, um, although there are some huge health problems also with aquaculture and with um, lead content in, in conventional wild-caught fish. But um, fish in general has a fairly high omega-3 um, fatty acid content, which um, is something lots of people really want to eat because um, it seems to be very healthy. And those omega-3s, fish actually don't um, have an inherent high omega-3 content. They get those omega-3s by eating algae um, in their natural environments or from aquaculture, from the omega-3s that are in the fish feed. Um, and so when we think about cultivated fish, we need to get to a place where cultivated fish has the same nutrition profile, but the cells are not uh, swimming in the ocean eating algae. So we need to make sure to actually add the omega-3 in the process. And that points, I think, to another exciting opportunity for cultivated meat and seafood. Because it is done in this controlled environment, we can basically tinker around with it. We can try to make red meat, for example, more healthy. There is research currently undergoing in Spain that especially looks into that. So it looks into what are the genetic factors that um, influence um, the fact that red meat um, is associated with um, certain types of cancer. And how can we make sure that in cultivated meat we can maybe deactivate um, those elements that would um, yeah, risk, um, increase the risk of cancer? So there's a lot of opportunity um, down the line to actually increase the healthiness of those products. And why has there been a recent inflection in funding for all meat? Yeah, that's interesting. So if you see, if you saw the, or look back to the graph that I showed earlier, um, for fermentation and for cultivated meat, um, the private capital investment has actually been um, really going up very, very fast. For plant-based meat and plant-based alternatives more broadly, we've seen a bit of a leveling. Um, that is in part because the way those investments are counted. So we count their venture capital investments. And in plant-based, we've seen recently that some of the big investments actually didn't come from venture capital, but we had mergers, we had actually buyouts, and we had um, public um, companies going public and raising money that way. But the other factor is um, just in general that the economy we currently live in, live in is fairly unfavorable to um, those kinds of investments. So I would say um, while this is um, cause for some concern um, in the plant-based um, meat story, if you will, the fundamentals are still pretty strong um, that this industry is going to keep growing.
Thank you. And do you consider any other goals in policy work in plant-based, the plant-based sector other than investments and funding? Yeah, so in plant-based, I think, um, especially here in Europe, we've seen quite a bit of um, attempts to push back against um, these products um, being able to use names like meat, plant-based chicken, um, veggie burger. So we've seen attempts um, at the legislative level to ban the use of these meat-related terms for plant-based products. Um, and so one of the things we have been doing over the past three years as GFI, but together with other organizations like ProVeg and industry and other NGOs, is to really push back against those labeling restrictions. And we've been quite successful at the EU level. So in 2020, um, there was a vote in the European Parliament about the so-called veggie burger ban, um, and we narrowly won that vote. Um, so at the EU level at the moment, I would say, um, we've defeated those proposals, but now we see those proposals popping up again at the national level in France and in some other countries. So on the plant-based side, that has kept us busy. Um, and then for the other alternative proteins, um, fermentation and especially cultivated, the question of regulatory approval is a really important one um, because those are, of course, novel types of products. They cannot just be developed and being sold on the market. They need to be first um, approved by public regulators and, and making sure the regulators know what these products are, uh, the companies know the process they have to go through, um, and in general, having an approval process that is clear, transparent, robust, efficient, that's one of our priorities in our policy work. And have there been animal welfare campaigns to influence not only large companies' PR with consumers, but also the internal PR slash moral of employees? Are they effective, if so? That is a great question, and I don't know the answer to that. I don't have the insight into those internal uh, <laughs> into those internal processes, unfortunately. I, hope, I would hope so, that they would have an influence, yeah. Okay, and one more. Uh, you said that it's been proven that addressing individual consumer choices hasn't had a big impact on the industry. At which level are we likely to see the most change in the coming years? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I mean, I, I wouldn't say we have proven that individual choice doesn't work at all. We just saw very, very low effect sizes and um, actually follow through of people who, for example, for a few weeks eat less meat, but then they bounce back. So we've seen those effects. I'm not sure if we should expect um, a similar approach of like individual diet change actually making a big difference. Maybe in some populations, especially like highly educated young urban um, areas. But I think overall, we just don't get away from the fact that taste, price, and convenience is what really matters for most consumers, not just here in Germany and Europe, in the US and the Western world, uh, or the broader global north, but especially in like emerging economies where we just see this very strong relationship between rising incomes um, and rising meat consumption. And there I think we just have to make sure we develop these alternative proteins that then can compete on price, on taste with the conventional ones. And probably connected to this, the last question I, we have time to I bring up, uh, you have been speaking about the EU, UK, and US. What about the meat industry in Asia? Are there any initiatives being taken in the main meat consumption countries of Asia? Yeah, so that is uh, a really good point, and that is where I think some of the strongest optimism, at least for me personally, comes from. So um, just to give two examples, um, in China, um, which is, of course, the largest meat producer in the world, the largest um, consumer as well, um, most of the farmed animals are in China. Um, we've seen both um, more and more startups being founded in the alternative protein space, and we've also seen actually the government um, recognizing the need for alternative proteins. So earlier this year in January, um, the Ministry of Agriculture in China published its next five-year agricultural plan, and in there they included a commitment um, to increase investment and scale-up of alternative proteins, including cultivated meat. And that's, of course, great for China and great for the animals there, but it's also just a huge signal to the rest of the world um, that they really, if they want to um, start or like continue innovating and really um, grow their own economies um, in this new sector, they need to keep up with China. And then the, the other example is an individual company. Um, so Thai, the Thai Union, which is one of the largest fish and seafood producers in Southeast Asia, they've started to invest in their own plant-based range, plant-based seafood, um, and they have started to partner up with um, large, uh, with a large, one of the largest cultivated meat startups, Blue Nalu, to develop that and bring that actually to Southeast Asia. So those are the, the, the ones in Asia that make me really optimistic. 
Thank you. And if it didn't uh, bring up your question, Alex has uh, office hours tomorrow, Sunday, from 11.30 to 12.30. And, and you can find Alex at Newton, uh, New the Newton room that's on the second floor. Thank you so much, Alex. Thank you. Those were great questions. <laughs>